Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to be talking to you about Romano British brooches. Now, I've given you two examples here that we're going to be looking at in more detail. I've got the duck brooch on the left hand side and the sandal brooch. Um, now, these fibulae are uh, often called Romano-British. They are simply found in Britain during the 1st century BC to the 4th century, and dated to 1st century BC to 4th century AD, and so are termed Romano-British, when in fact there might be more complex things going on there. And that's what we're going to be considering today. Um, they're really curious objects. They are in most museum collections. They come from all sorts of different places across the UK and in France. But their meanings elude us, and it's their meanings that I think can give us a good idea of what people are thinking and therefore how connected to Romanness and generally their own identity people are in that area. So to give you the brooches in their context, here are sort of the a nice sort of range of brooches that are available in Roman Britain at the time. So you've got owl brooches, hares or rabbits, horses, dragonesque fibulae, which are some of the most famous examples, uh, hammers and sort of general shapes. Um, and we've got a sort of menagerie going on, like there's all sorts of animals available and many people have tried to connect these with different deities and different things. We're going to be looking and seeing if that sort of theory applies to the sandal brooches and to the ducks. So brooches themselves are quite small. I've given as an example um, a Chelsea football shirt and a little badge that you can buy in a Chelsea football shop. I'm afraid Cardiff City football is too difficult to find the pictures for. Um, a two pound coin and an example of a brooch. They're all quite small, but nonetheless they are visible and they're the sort of things that up close would have really stood out and people would have really seen the meanings of these, just as you would with a Chelsea football badge. Furthermore, if you're looking for meaning, if you're looking for them, or you understand the meaning of them, they're far more significant. So although they're small, I don't think we should overlook them necessarily. Um, another point is that the original colour of the brooches would have been similar to that at the edge of the two-pound coin, and therefore would have been far more striking. So the most famous example of the brooches, the one that's discussed most often, is the dragonesque fibulae. Now, they're often taken to be examples of a hybrid culture. Um, they have the stereotypically Latin look about them, but are found in specifically Roman sites in Northern Britain. Um, therefore, they are deemed to be perfect examples of a hybrid culture in Roman Britain. However, there again, there is some debate about this. We don't, for all of the brooches, it's very, very rare to get a provenance. This is one example of one which is actually found in a site However, most examples, as this Instagram post from a metal detective shows, are just found without a specific site um, and often aren't recorded. So it's very difficult to say anything specific about a connection to a site, nor um, what they mean from where they're found. However, they're nonetheless really meaningful and colourful. Um, but unfortunately, we don't really look at them that often as academics. Very rarely do we see stuff written about them. And this is because most of them come up in auctions and they're in private collections. Uh, and this is a big shame, but it also, for me, is an example of why we ought to be working with the art industry a lot more. Um, when they are found, they are often, oh, sorry. They are often reported on the Plotter Antiquity Scheme. And we've got them dotted about all over Britain. We particularly find them in the north, but this is because metal detecting activity is quite strong in the north. Um, so it's, again, difficult to say too much. However, what we can say is that they are quite similar looking from Britain. Here are three examples from more sort of northern Midlands-ish Britain. Um, they're not too dissimilar in style. We've got the blue enamel, which is functioning with both of these. And the shape is quite similar. Um, and when we look at the examples that come from more all over the place, we see that there's different things going on, different colour enamels, more rounded shapes, different things. However, the same idea is appearing all over the Roman Western Empire. And I think this is because hobnails had just been introduced at that point. 
we have very little, in fact, no evidence for hobnails appearing in Britain or in France from before the Romans came. Now, famously, we've got the Caligae, the Roman military boot that was stamping its way across Britain and France and generally the Western Empire at that point. But it's not just the military. There are other things going on. In the second century, uh, a Christian writer, Clement of Alexandria, writes that prostitutes were reforming their hobnails in their boots to say, follow me. So as they were walking along and they were leaving their trails behind them, men could, well, and women perhaps, would know where to follow them to. And I think there's an idea then of marking your place, marking your identity. And this can come up quite clearly in the brooches, Oops. which look exactly the same and where the artist has really gone to the effort of putting in the yellow enamel hobnails. Um, so the military connection cannot altogether be thrown out. Um, brick stamps that are specifically military ones uh, made by legions across the empire have got these sandal with hobnail imprints on them. But what I'm asking you to think about here is that perhaps it's not just about that, there are other things. Um, so going back to the idea of a sandal or a shoe print as being a personal identity marker, I think good evidence for this comes from these two brooches here, which have inscriptions on them. This one, sorry, it's a bit unclear, says Ave Adianto, which is Latin for goodbye to that person who is coming. Not massively sensible, we'll get there later. And this one is Ave Wimpy, which uh, is a hybrid itself between a Latin word Ave and a Gallic word Wimpy, which means beautiful. So we've got it's hello beautiful <laughs> on a brooch. Um, Ave Adianto is taken to be a typo. Uh, it should be Ave Amanto, meaning again something like hello lovely or uh, hello love. So we've got a sort of something beyond military going on here. Uh, perhaps it connects back to the prostitutes and the idea of leaving behind something for someone to follow. Or perhaps it's just a nice greeting. However, I think these certainly can't altogether be attributed to the military. Um, furthermore, oh, where am I? feet and footprints are very common in terra sigillata uh, as a marker of the identity of the pot maker. And so I think more generally in the Roman Empire, we do have this idea of feet and footprints being identity markers. However, there's another explanation. They've been connected to these fibuli, which are chickens, as markers of Mercury, the god Mercury, who is protecting travellers and all sorts of things. And the footprint and sandal being, well, feet being so important for travelling, a lot of people, a lot of researchers have seen them as being connected together as divine symbols. Uh, now, as we know, Mercury was a particularly prominent and important god in Roman Britain. And here are some examples of statues that were found. So this one's from Uli. And these two are both in the British Museum. Um, and what we might be seeing, therefore, is a demand or um, an invocation of the god on the self. Uh, so putting on a sort of a brooch is a sort of amuletic process, asking for the power of the god to be channeled through the brooch. Um, and this is certainly something that we see in Romano, um, well, Roman generally, uh, gemstones, which some of which have Aphrodite upon them, and they are calling upon the goddess to function um, romantically as a good luck charm. So the, uh, the sandal fibulae are much more complicated than just being simply a military item. I think the turning point, however, the sort of most crucial fact about them is that they must be in the, a Roman hybrid, uh, because without the Romans, there would not have been the hobnails in Britain. However, I think there is certainly more than Romanness going on. Uh, with that in mind, we're going to start looking at the duck fibulae, uh, which are also found in Roman Britain, but also Roman France. Um, these are particularly beautiful brooches, and so these are particularly found in private collections and often appear in auction houses, um, which is, again, such a shame because it means very few appear in museums. But nonetheless, I think we need to look at them a bit more closely as academics. Um, when they would have been put on the body, as we can see from the up, they would have sort of had a bird's eye view about them. 
um, which would enable the enamel to be really clearly shown, but would have also created quite a nice effect, which we'll look at a little bit later. So in terms of the fine spots, these really appear far more commonly than the sandals. They have a sort of much more popular appeal by the looks of things. Um, this is a very nice example of one that was, again, come up in an auction last week. Um, so they are coming up, they are popular, they are being found consistently, uh, much more so than the sandals. However, these meanings particularly elude us, and there's very little literature on what they mean. Um, so going back again to the idea that we're looking at them from a bird's eye perspective, I think one of the clear appeals of these brooches goes beyond religion, goes beyond identity, and is simply that they make very nice a, a sort of joke, a visual metaphor of a duck swimming up the body. And this is played on in this Basiut's, um vessel, where as liquid would be poured out from the spout, it would look as if the duck was swimming in water. So I think we've certainly got just generally, the appeal of a nice duck. And I think some of you at home may even have duck ornaments or at least have seen, perhaps especially in um, older generations, my grandmother has ducks all over the house. Um, but there's certainly more to it than that. If we look at dining assemblages, we have ducks appearing on spoons. So all of these handles here, you can see have duck heads on them. Now again, this is because of a Roman innovation that was happening uh, in the time of the empire. Columella, Varro, Cicero all talk about their duck houses. Um, duck houses in the elite, perhaps that's something that we can understand. Um, but certainly this was something happening quite a lot. And in Britain as well, we have evidence from Vindolanda that shows that one of the foods that was commonly being eaten by the governor was duck. Ducks were being increasingly looked at as a dining um, food. And I think this is perhaps one of the reasons that the duck brooches become more common. They are a marker of elite. Um, and that's weird as an idea until you start looking at Egyptian uh, art, where ducks are dining goods, but they're still being used um, in an artistic way, especially in, Rome, in mummies. Um, and we still ha don't really know the full meaning of the amulets that we find in mum uh, duck amulets that we find. But I think it's very difficult to identify a specific meaning. We don't get very many, very many mentions of ducks in Greek and Roman mythology, nor do we get many meanings of ducks in sort of wider British and Celtic contexts. So I do like looking out to other cultures, um, and certainly amulets in Egypt are a good one, but we've also got appearances like this. This is a bronze mirror with a nude lady who is holding in her hand a duck. And it has been suggested that this is because the duck has a far more sexual context to it. Again, different part of the world, similar idea. This is a statue of Eros in terracotta who is holding next to him a duck. Um, and in ancient Greek, we have a similar word as in English and certain dialects, ducky, for a loved one. Just this idea is one that perhaps could be on display and perhaps explain the wider popularity of the duck brooch in Britain as opposed to, say, the sandal one. If they have meanings connected with love, connected with general sex and sexuality, this might be a reason for their popularity. And this might be something that we can't actually trace um, on the archaeological record. Nonetheless, however, there are some things that we can trace. And this is a statue of Sequana, the native deity of the Seine in France. Um, and she is riding on a duck boat. However, these duck brooches in that part of France are very, very rare. So I would hesitate to connect the two together. But it's certainly a possibility that a female deity could be associated with the brooches. And as with the sandal brooches, we're looking at the desire to channel the god through the brooch. So I'm afraid I haven't particularly made clear what the duck or the sandal brooch mean. But I think we need to be looking at them beyond Roman meanings, sort of typical meanings of um, a sandal being a Roman military boot, and indeed perhaps not thinking at all about Roman meanings for the duck brooch, and instead thinking more widely about what putting a sandal or putting a duck on your body actually means. And that's it from me. Thank you for listening.